So, uh, just so we're clear, in the times of Jesus, what was happening was every year, every person had to go give an account of their farm, their, their, their crops, their animals, their livestock. Uh, yeah. Oh. Can you hear me? Can you guys hear me? Yeah, people can hear me. I can hear you. Yeah, Pamela, you can't hear me? She's upstairs. Okay, she's gonna probably go up and come again. She, I, I don't know if you guys can hear her. She was like, I can't hear you. I'm thinking like, I can't hear you. So, okay, I'm sorry. Okay, she's gonna get back on, okay. So, what I was saying was, at the time of Jesus, um, where you have to go, can you hear me now, Pamela? Testing, one, two, three. Test, one, two, three. Okay, I hear you now. Okay, okay, great. Welcome! <laughs> okay, uh, so like I was saying, at the time of Jesus, where every year you have to go give an account uh, for your crops, your, your livestock, your land, your property, um, any babies born, you just had to give an, an accounting of what, what you had. Now, during the year of uh, uh, the season of Yom Kippur and make it amends, um, you you know, there's literally there's a chart on what you have to, like, for example, if you shed innocent blood, what is my penance? And the penance would be like two turtle doves and a, and a bowl or, you know, whatever, whatever the, the, the sin was, there was a, a, uh, a chart on what you had to offer as a sacrifice instead of you. So if you told a lie, it would, it would cost one sheep. You know what I mean? So there was um, a, 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 a pay scale, a pay chart on what you had to offer for your penance. So that's bad enough. That in itself is bad enough, bad enough. But what was happening was when you went to go bring sheep so people could buy them, so they could use them for their penance, the guys who were in charge of the money increased the prices for the sheep. So in other words, if you, if you own sheep and you're coming to Israel because you know people were going to go buy your lambs so they could sacrifice them, the money changers charged you for that. They charged you to, to sell your sheep. So there was a pre-tax on that. So in a, for example, if I had 10 sheep, I'm going to sell each one for a dollar, right? So I'm going to make 10 bucks. Well, they were charging me 20. So I, I had to come out of pocket $20 to the money changers before I even sold one. So I had to give them $20. I'm only looking to make 10. So they made off, they made money off me just for me being there, right? But then for the people who were going to pay a dollar, they would charge a dollar fifty. So they were making money off the people offering the livestock and making money off the people who were trying to buy the livestock. So they were charging too high on this side and too much on this side. And then if you sold something, you got taxed on the way out. So they are making, they are literally, literally robbing people blindly because they knew you had to buy it. They took advantage of you. What's that expression? A uh, uh, thing that's called, um, you know, when it rains, uh, if, uh, if, uh, if a store, if, if it's raining and you need an umbrella, all of a sudden the price of uh, price gouging. They were doing some serious price gouging. You know, it's illegal to price gouge. It's just because it's raining, you had umbrellas for sale for $5. All of a sudden it starts raining, you jack up the price to eight fifty. That's wrong. It's price gouging. So the money changers at that time were the most hated, the most uh, 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 shunned people because not only did they charge the people who had livestock and flock and sheep, they also charged the people who they knew you're going to have to buy so you can God can forgive you for sins. So they were like, <laughs> charging, and then plus, 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 plus. It being because where they were at the time with Rome overseeing everything and then being from the Greek language, uh, people from Egypt, from Turkey, they were all coming. So they kept charging you on your currency exchange. So they are making millions. So people hated them by the thousands. They hated, hated these dudes. So you can imagine when Jesus calls a money changer, Matthew, to join his team. Especially for people like Peter, who in fact was a fisherman, who got taxed by these by these uh, money changers, sitting in the same boat with the people you hate. God is good, y'all. He made you sit with people he knew you couldn't stand. That's amazing.
So while that was all going on, Jesus kind of blurred the lines uh, between the, uh, uh, the, the, the factions. So between money changers, uh, tax collectors, shepherds, uh, Luke was a doctor, and, and then Mark was a kid. So they had all these different personalities, all these little character traits, and they were all in one big old boat together. And Jesus made them all get along. God is good, y'all. That being said, we see now that um, in today's society, people want to still continue to draw lines when Jesus is trying to erase the lines. If, if, I, I told you guys before, I'll just say it real fast, that um, I told this one brother who was kind of critical of people and kind of judgmental, I said, hey, did you hear about that guy, that minister who was um, hanging out with prostitutes? And he goes like, oh. and he's just, he's just, just going, Joel was a TJ. I mean, he just wanted some dirt. He wanted some dirt so he can go, ooh. I mean, you, you can just see this guy's face. He was like just salivating at the fact that I was going to mention somebody's name, a famous guy who was singing, hanging out with prostitutes. And I said, oh, what was his name? And I picked up the Bible and I said, oh yeah, that was, uh, oh yeah. Oh, it was Jesus. And he was just like, He didn't cuss at me, but I knew he called he called me every bad word name in the Bible. I mean, he was just like, and he wanted to just go off me. You can just tell he wanted to go off, but he was like saying, "I'm not going to say it. I'm not going to say it. I won't give him. I won't give him the pleasure. I won't say it." He just walked away from me. But my point being was that, yeah, and, I, and yeah, I got my little victory on that because. Here, this individual was trying to make it a point of saying how righteous and holy we need to be, and anybody who is not righteous and holy needs to be, you know, kind of kicked out of the club, if you will. And I explained to him, uh, I when I kind of brought brought it to his attention that there was a particular minister who was seen hanging out with prostitutes. He, he just was like felt like yes, I mean, he just couldn't wait to put this in a post or a tweet. Or some kind of IG post. I mean, he was just salivating, looking for the opportunity, and then pointing out his own self. There's nothing worse than being like when Nathan went before went before King David and said, "King, check this out. There's a guy who is taking advantage of somebody else's sheep." And David's all, "What? Oh no, no, no! We need to kill this dude. No, no, not in my king. No, we don't allow that. No, 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 no." And Nathan says, "My king, the individual is you." All needs to be said. All that needs to be said. Same thing with Judah. When Tamar, when he slept with Tamar and then deny her that right, and then the, the brother said, the guy, uh, Tamar said, the person who owns this staff, this signet, and this ring, he is the one who slept with me. And then he was like, okay, touche. 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 So I love that fact. I love the fact that um, when you try to act so super righteous and so super holy, that God has a way of um, showing the issue is you. So I just want to just kind of clarify that because um, I, you know, we sh we're not we're we're not called to hate. Uh, we're called to like obviously hate the sin, but love the people. Okay. So that being said, try to try not to be so us and them. Um, yes, there is an us and them. We are to call it to separate ourselves from the world, uh, but we still need to exist in the world. In the in the hopes that we would win some for Christ, so we gotta work together. We gotta get along somehow. So I just wanted to share that with you guys. Uh, that being said, so um, in accordance to kind of go with the flow um, that we were talked about for the past few weeks about even the rainbow and the colors. Um, I want to talk about just taking this because I brought this up on Wednesday to kind of put it all in full 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 spectrum. Because when we talk about colors, <clears throat> I mentioned that. Uh, the Bible is so vibrant with color. I mean, Joseph had the coat of many colors, which was a rainbow, by the way. And as we're going to get into that in a second. So all the colors of the rainbow are displayed, even in the high priest, high priest uh, ephod. So God is very bright, vibrant. He's very uh, uh, um, uh, uh, infatuated with the different shades and the different colors. And reason being, uh, even in the throne room, the Bible says there's a rainbow around the throne. And so there's Sardis and, and uh, well, uh, 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 turquoise and, and uh, um, sapphires and rubies and diamonds and emeralds. All these beautiful gemstones. 
are surrounding heaven, which means that light that it emanates, it's so beautiful. It's a radiant place full of color and beauty. It's a beautiful thing. It's a beautiful thing. So again, talking about the rainbow, talking about the colors, uh, we're going to tie, tie that all in this time uh, with this session. And we're going to talk about the 12 jewels of Israel. As you can see from the sea file, it's a, it's a really a, a bad display, uh, but you can see how there's violet, blue, red, gold, uh, there, there's light there and light blue, so it's not really a, you know a, a a perfect color rainbow. But with the human eye, we see the seven colors on any on any any, any given day after a rain has come through. But there are a whole lot more variety of shades of color within it. It's just that the human eye, when you see it bright on the sky, that so one before. I'm sorry. Um, that being said, I was going to say these words. There are other colors that are some uh, are there are. Uh, Connected or in correlation with heaven. One reason why this. We say the blue is blue is the color of, uh, of revelation, but it also speaks of transparency, which is, means like if something is revealed. When well, something is transparent, it is revealed. So the Bible says, "And God separated the waters from the earth, uh, separated the waters from the heaven above and the earth below." So in that span, as it's called, the separation of the waters above and the water below. Water is clear, but according to the the spectrum of light. When, when the, earth, the curvature of the earth bends, what you see is the color blue, which present, then presents the blue sky with the blue water, which is why we get that blue color, because of that, that ray of spectrum when the earth curves and the bending of light, the blue hue is a spectrum we see, which is why it reflected from the sky when it, when, on the, and also in the water. Now, if you were to hop on a spaceship and go out in space, It'll be 12 o'clock in the afternoon, but when you go out in space, it's all black. Why is that? Why is it when you go out in space, it's all black? Because you're out of the spectrum of light that is hitting the Earth. <laughs> and if you were in your spaceship and everything's all black, and you look back at the Earth, you're going to see that the Earth looks blue. The water looks blue. Why? Because that's the color of water that it's just when the, the bit, when, because the Earth is round, when light is hitting it, when it bends, the part of the rainbow that you see that's that that's particularly there is blue. Now, the best part about that is this, as we get into this. Ready for this? Mystic Revelation! The Bible says the streets of heaven are made of gold, right? And the Bible says there's gold, and, and especially the land of, uh, of Israel, uh, on the earth, there's gold in the earth. So if there's gold in heaven, there's gold in earth, meant that there had to have been a separation. So between that, the spans, which is basically the separation part where the flooring or the foundation of heaven and we see the floor of earth, there are particles that when God separates them because of the Garden of Eden, God, there was a separation where like, we lost that connection. Particles are kind of left like in the atmosphere. Did you know there's so much gold in the atmosphere? Did you know that? Gold is, is weightless. That's one reason it floats. So the particles of gold in the atmosphere, when light hits gold, it turns blue. Good afternoon, everybody. So one of the reasons why the color spectrum and the curvature of the earth, when light begins to hit the earth, the reason why you see blue water is because of the curvature and the bending of light, uh, hitting, bouncing off the gold in the atmosphere, uh, and the, the bending of that light, we see the blue hue, which reflects the sky, and also the water. Have you noticed that if you've ever been to the beach or a lake, sometimes the water looks green, but yet the sky don't look green. <laughs> water is clear. It's crystal clear. Why then is it reflected off of the sky? Because light is bouncing back off the gold in the atmosphere. Just so we're clear. Let's talk about the 12 jewels. The authorized list of jewels is, first of all, there's the red jasper sardius, uh, the citrine quartz, I'm sorry, citrine quartz, which is topaz, the emerald, the ruby, which is carbuncle, lapis lazuli, the sapphire, rock crystal, diamond, 
Golden Sapphire Ligure or Ligure, Blue Sapphire Agate, Amethyst, Yellow Jasper, Crystallite, Golden Beryl Onyx, Crystal Fra Phrase, which is Jasper. The Hebrew names are Odem, Pitta, Barakat, Nofek, Saphir, Yaholam, Leshem, Shibo, Alama, Tarshish, Shalom, Yasapeth. Now, isn't it interesting? You probably have seen these words once or twice in the Bible, but I had no idea they meant the color. Isn't it interesting? Sands of the seashore. Genesis chapter 22, verse 17 and 18 says, That in blessings I will bless thee, and in multiplying I will multiply thy seed as the stars of the heaven, and as the sea, as sand which is upon the seashore, and thy seed shall possess the gates of his enemies. And in thy seed shall all the nations of the earth be blessed, because thou hast obeyed my voice. Most of the gemstones are sand based. Did you know that? According to the instructions of Moses concerning uh, the Levitical priesthood, Exodus 28 15 says, And thou shalt make the breastplate of judgment with cunning work. After the work of the ephod, uh, thou shalt make it of gold. Look at, look at, let's talk about God loves color. God is telling him, make it of gold, blue, purple, and scarlet, scarlet, and of fine twine linen, thou shalt make it. Four square it shall, it, sh it shall, it, I'm sorry, it shall be being doubled. A span shall be the length thereof, and a span shall be the breadth of it. Basically, make it square. And thou shalt set it in settings of stone, even four rows of stone. The first row shall be sardius, topaz, a carbuncle, shall be the first row. The second row, emerald, sapphire, diamond. Third, Ligur, Agat, Amethyst, uh, and the fourth, Beryl, Onyx, Jasper. They shall set it in gold in their enclosings. And the stones shall be the names of the children of Israel. Twelve, according to their names, like the engraving of a signet. Every one of them, every one with his name, shall be the according to the twelve, dry, twelve tribes. Now, isn't it interesting that God chose a specific color for each tribe? Interesting. As you can see here in this, in this uh, uh, image right here, you can see how a rainbow could be seen from the, uh, the you know, from the red to the gold to the yellow to the green to the different phases and phase, phases, uh, shapes, rather, I'm sorry, from like the dark blue to high blue of the blue to the pur uh, purple to the white, all kind of creating a rainbow effect without really being put in rainbow order. Every gemstone should be soft enough to engrave it by the usual engraving techniques known in ancient times. These jewel stones should be large enough to engrave names upon it to be easily readable from an arm's length distance. The high priestly breastplate is almost 22 centimeters, about nine inches wide. Um, allowing for stones up to five centimeters, about two inches wide. So the whole the breastplate itself is about nine inches, which about two inches for each of those things, leaving about two four six, with some space on both sides. So you got about three inches to play with, about an inch on each side. So God even st strategically mapped out the ephod to place it. I mean, beautifully, perfectly set. It's amazing how God took the time to lay out the colors matching each son of Israel. Additionally, the breastplate contained the names of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and the words Shifte Yeshurun which basically means the tribe, tribes of Israel, uh, thus featuring all 22 letters of the Hebraic alphabet. So even upon the, the high priest is literally contained within it every single letter of the Hebrew alphabet. It's 
the 12 gemstones of Israel, Israel's tribal gems are valued as semi-precious. They have no greater hardness or brilliance, but they're nevertheless very beautiful. The color of the jewels is important in understanding the prophetic significance of uh, Israel's tribes. For example, Reuben, the first one, the firstborn rather, the core represents the powerful energy of everything that comes first. The first fruit, the first moment of the day, the beginning of every creation. It has enormous amounts of energy. Unstable like water, this power can go either way. If harnessed properly, the Bakor, the beginning, the Ruvan, energy can change worlds. If abused, it can destroy. Like water, it can be the source of life. But if it's unch unchanneled, it erodes its environment and can flood its surroundings. This one reason why it's significance when Reuben, when they took Joseph and they went to kill him, Reuben was like, no, 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 let's not kill the guy, come on. Let's just kind of like, just don't kill him because then, uh, you know, dad's going to come after me and I don't want that because I'm a firstborn. Let's not even go there. So he's the kind of guy who brings up national, the reality, the first thought, firstborn kid. Simeon, the aggressor. Simeon is aggressive Gervura, the antithesis of Reuben's water. The fierce anger and cruel wrath that can result from unbridled Gervura must be eliminated, lest it turns into weapons of violence that consume the person and all it comes in contact with. Levi, red, the clergy. Levi is a tribe chosen to serve in the temple. Levi also means attached or joined. Levi is a personality of dedicating your life to serving a higher calling, of freeing yourself from your bounds to material survival and attaching yourself to divine service. Judah, the Thardinate, it's a pale gray, pinkish color. The leader, Judah means acknowledgement. Judah's name includes the four letters of the divine Havaya, yod heh Judah is the leader. His descendants would be the kings of Israel, beginning with King David and concluding with Jesus. Dan, white jade, misty white, the judge. Dan is a path of law and order. Dan actually means to judge. Naphtali. The free spirit, it's free spirit. It's a purple violet color. Naphtali is uh, the free spirit personality, like a deer running free, breaking out of the statute status quo. Independence is a necessary component in growth. Yet this free spiritness must always take care to deliver words of beauty. Gad, chrysophrase. It's like an apple green or gold tinted green. It's the warrior. Gad is the warrior archetype. Expanding on the justice of Dan, Gad is ready to fight for his beliefs. The warrior is necessary to both defend our cherished values and protect our freedoms. Let me just stop real quick, right, guys. Yeah, just, just so we're clear, the reason why it's significant about the colors is because when the different tribes, the, the, the 12 tribes were in Israel, of Israel were in, um, uh, in the Exodus, um, when they would put the tabernacle up, all the tribes had to sit in an assigned area around the tabernacle. Did you know that? And so while the tabernacle is, is the tent is, the tents, the, the tent pegs of the tabernacle are put in place, north, south, east, and west, there are three tribes here, three tribes here, three tribes here, three tribes here. But every time they would get up, pack everything up, they pack up the, the tabernacle, all the, um, the tent pegs, and begin to mosey out towards, going towards Egypt, towards uh, Jerusalem, Israel, a lot of people can get either going slow, uh, walking too fast. You can get mixed up amongst your people. So what they would do is they'd wave a flag, and by waving that flag of the color, you just identify, hey, if you're, you know, we're we're the pale green, we're Judah, we're over here. So you could hear Judah Raiders, Kansas City Chiefs, and then you couldn't hear nobody because everybody's screaming. So they they would wave wave up a banner. With the color signifying, this is our tribe, we're over here. So he, they, everybody had a flag that represented 
their color, so they knew what tribe you're following. So the person holding up, you know, this is black, but whatever, the, the, the jade, emerald color, whatever color that they had, they would kind of wave this around, you know, like you do at the airport, and you would just follow the flag. That's what the Bible says. And his banner over us is love. <laughs> so you follow, you follow the love flag, point B. So the warrior Gad is necessary to both defend our cherished values and to protect our freedoms. Asher, lavender, the prosperous one. Asher is both prosperity and pleasure. Asher is the dimension of blessing beyond the norm, to be given more than what is necessary for survival. Asher is a personality of not just getting what you need, but also enjoying it. You know, I, I got to tell you, one of the reasons why I, I get so, like, enamored by the Father's love and the Father's heart is because when I remember I was a kid, well, younger, you know, 16, 17, I worked at the zoo, the L.A. Zoo, and I worked in the concession stand. And I saw this grandpa with his grandkids, and I've never seen anybody act this way. I mean, his kids, I was like maybe like, I don't know, three or four of them there. It was just amazing. Every little kid. That came up to him, like, you know, Grandpa, Grandpa, let's go see the monkeys. He goes, okay, okay, yeah. he goes, you guys hungry? And he pulled out his wallet and he just pulled out 20s. Like, here, here, go here, go go buy some popcorn. Here, go go buy some candy. Here, here. And then he would go, you guys got that money? You need some more money? Go here, take some more money. And I'm watching Grandpa just pour out money. It was just the most beautiful thing because these kids were just like, uh, hey, you think your friend wants some money? Does he have any money? I don't, okay, oh, here, yeah, just give it to him anyway. Just go, this is the guys who want you to join us. And then he kept saying, do you guys have enough? Do you have enough? Do you need some more? And I'm just watching this guy like, you know, <laughs> and I say that because generally from the concession stand, there's always a kid that says, ooh, mom, can I have that? And go, no, 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 we got that at home. You don't need that right now. No, 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 no. And so, you know, kind of like, not that, you know, there, there was, it wasn't that the parent was being mean, but literally kind of like said, you know, uh, you can tell they're on a budget, you know, limited funds. I, I understand. I understand. But to see the contrast of this guy going, do you have enough? Do you need more? No, 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 here. Just take more. Then he goes, just to be on the safe side, have 20 more. And it looked like he gave each kid at least 70, uh, uh, 50 to $70 each kid by saying, why don't you go get something to eat? And I mean, obviously, Grandpa, maybe he's just in love with his kids, and maybe this is the only time that had money to give, but I'm just watching this guy, like, not a care. Not a care. All he kept wondering was, do the kids have enough? Here, you need some more? And he just kept pouring his love on his kids. You know, the kids were like, yeah, I got enough. You know, there's more than enough. There's more than enough. A pack of popcorn is a dollar, y'all. They, these kids could have bought 20 bags of popcorn and still bought some for every other kid and then fed the ducks. I mean, it was like so much money this guy was pouring out. And so every time I think about God and his, his generosity and his compassion, it's like that Asher, when there's uh, the, 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 what's our daily need, but then there's the abundance, there's the overflow to where you don't got to worry about it anymore. It's a beautiful thing, y'all. It's a beautiful thing. So every time I, every time I always think about, I'm just letting you guys know my, the inner workings of Andre's mind. When I think about God's abundance, I think about that grandpa blessing his grandkids. And it's, it's still to this day, it just touches me. Um, so Asher is both prosperity and pleasure. Asher is a dimension of blessing beyond the norm, to be given more than what is necessary for survival. Asher is a personality of not just getting what you need, but also enjoying it. There's one thing about getting your bills paid. Thank you, God, for paying the bills. It's a blessing when you know that there's enough money in the bank after you pay your bills, you have enough to go buy pay somebody else's bill. That's how you know you are blessed. When after all of your needs are met, you have enough finances to go bless somebody else. It is in that frame of mind that God is preparing us to be in, not just to just barely make it, but to have more than enough to bless somebody else. And now we're on the subject and topic about the tabernacle. The tabernacle of Moses, as we were talking about, the tribes of Israel had to give the tribe of Levi because they were not given any land. They were the ones who were sold, their sole mandate was to cater to, take care of, and service the tabernacle in the house of God. That was it. 
So by the other 11 tribes were then required to take a tenth of what they had to support and to financially bless the tribe of Levi. The tribe of Levi themselves had to take a 10% tithe and give it to the tribe of Aaron. But they're the ones specifically assigned to walk in as high priests. So there was a double tie for Israel. One, for the people, the 11 tribes, to give it to the, the tribe of Levi. And then for Levi to give a tithe to the tribe of Aaron, to the family clan of Aaron. So in that double tithe, there was more than enough for everybody to have enough because God was blessing. Now, that's the tabernacle of Moses. In the tabernacle of David, it's the exact opposite. In the tabernacle of David, the kingdom, the priesthood, the royal priesthood, and the holy priesthood are so prosperous, they are the ones who give out to the poor. Isn't that interesting? In the tabernacle of Moses, people gave into the kingdom. In the tabernacle of David, it is the kingdom giving out to the people. That's why the Bible says he's raising up the tabernacle of David. The tabernacle of David is where the body, the kingdom itself, is so blessed. They're the ones giving out to those who don't have. That is where we're going, y'all. Issachar, the Amazite, sea green, blue tinted green. This is the scholar. Issachar is a scholar. Scholarship provides wisdom, clarity, and direction. It is the foundation of any system. Issachar is the dedication to immerse in study and education. Issachar is the dedication to immerse in study and education. Zebulun, olivine, peridot, yellowish green, olive green color. This is the business person. Zebulun is the merchant, the business person personality. His role is to enter the marketplace and redeem the divine spark within the material world, the secret, uh, the secret treasure hidden in the sand, according to Deuteronomy 33, uh, 19. That says, they shall call the people to the mountain. There they shall offer sacrifices of righteousness, for they shall suck the bounty of the seas and treasures hidden in the sand. The treasures hidden in the sand. That is the mandate to obtain the treasures hidden in the sand. You'll get that in the morning. Joseph, the green jade, spinach green, pale to dark. This is the sufferer. Joseph is the element of suffering in life. Yet he only survives. Not, yet not only does he sur survive, he thrives. He achieves greatness through his challenges. He overcomes all adversities and becomes a great leader, saving his entire generation. Despite his corrupt environment, he maintains his spiritual integrity. The powerful light that emerges from darkness in Joseph divides into two dimensions, his two sons, Manasseh and Ephraim. In other words, what he contained was so powerful, it had to be, <laughs> had to be divided to the next generation. Come on, somebody. Benjamin, the lapis luzi, the sapphire, with bl uh, sapphire blue with gold flecks, the ravenous consumer. Benjamin is hungry, hunger for divine spark in all of his existence. So like a ravenous wolf, Benjamin recognizes that his mission is to pass passionately seek out the divine energy embedded in the matter, devour it, consume it, and elevate it. Now, take a look at the stone. Okay, isn't it beautiful? Just in its own natural beauty. Now, just so we're clear, when the Bible says when Moses went to go meet with God on Mount Sinai, when God was then carving out 
the ten utterances, the Bible says the ground that Moses stood upon while he was talking to God turned into that sapphire gold. So it's got this bluish uh, sapphire with the gold flecks in between. Is what happens when you encounter God, the environment that you're in begins to change like heaven. And the Bible says that out of these stones were carved. So what we're talking about is those that gold, uh, I'll just show you. The original commandments were carved within this stone. So the Ten Commandments were written on this lapis lazuli. So here you've got these beautiful lapis lazuli, sapphire stone with gold flecks, and it contains the Ten Utterances of God. And he's walking down Mount Sinai, and you might even say, what does this old guy, and I'm not going to, I'm not doing ages, ages, I'm just saying to walk down the mountain holding a very thing that, uh, at, let's just call it supernatural technology that he's holding in his hands. They were alive. They were a sentient living being. Nothing in heaven is dead. Good afternoon, everybody. Nothing in heaven is dead. So these commandments, these, these tablets are literally living, living tablets made of lapis luzi. But the closer it came down to earth, the closer it came into the presence of the debauchery, of the, the rebellion, of the, tre the, the, the trees and everything that was going on down with the, um, with the other tribes making a false god and the, uh, the golden calf, all of a sudden the supernatural purity within these tablets began to back away because evil will not ever, ever stand in the presence uh, of God. So what the closer Moses got, the heavy, the heavier the burden of these bricks that uh, these stones, tablets that Moses had to carry, to the point that when he gets down close to them, that all the goodness, all the purity has now gone from them. And this is why one reason why Moses broke them. While he had them, they were floating, they're walking, they're basically levitating by themselves. The closer he got, the heavier they began to hold the weight of that in his hands, which is why he broke them. The heavy burden to bear is to hold something that you cannot bear the weight of. This is why Jesus, this is why Jesus gives us a new commandment with new tablets written upon our hearts. Make sense now? Like the ravenous wolf, Binyamin recognizes that his mission is to passionately seek out the divine energy embedded in matter, like the Ten Commandments, devour it, consume it, and elevate it. Jesus, our high priest. The Twelve Apostles. Revelation 21, 11 says these words. Having the glory of God and its light was like a stone most precious even like a jasper stone, clear as crystal. And it had a great and high wall with 12 gates. And on the gates were 12 angels and having names inscribed, which are the names of the 12 tribes of the sons of Israel. From the east, three gates. From the north, three gates. From the south, three gates. And from the west, three gates. It's like the tabernacle of Moses. Moses had the tribes sit down, three on the north, three in the east, three in the south, three in the, on, the, on the west. And the wall of the city had 12 foundations, and in them were the names of the 12 apostles of the Lamb. So you have, just to kind of get the visual here, you've got three, 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 and three different colors, the beautiful colors of, of uh, the sons of Israel. So around the throne room was a beautiful emanating gemstones, radiating beautiful color. But even the foundations were 12 levers deep of, again, 12 different colors. So you've got colors under the foundation, colors on the walls, and colors in the gates. Ah, I mean, it was color everywhere and bouncing off that radiant light. So it looks like a 
have you ever have you ever seen somebody's diamond ring or a wedding ring and you look at it and it just kind of shimmers with all these beautiful colors and everywhere you turn is a different color that's what heaven is like it is going to shimmer and just kind of like this this beautiful bright light of these bright beautiful greens and blues and, and uh, amber gold colors just bouncing off everywhere because it just the light is just radiant so all of these beautiful beautiful different colors are all going off at the same time what a beautiful place it's going to be when we get there y'all and the wall of the city had 12 foundations and in them were the name of the 12 apostles of the lamb so the walls had the 12 sons of israel the foundation had the 12 apostles of the, of the lamb 21 18 says these words and the building of the wall of it was as jasper the spinach green and the city was pure gold, like unto clear glass. And the foundations of the walls of the city were guarded with all manners of precious stones. The first foundation was jasper, the second sapphire, <coughs> excuse me, the third chaldeny, the fourth an emerald, the fifth sardonyx, the sixth sardius, the seventh chrysolite, the eighth beryl, the ninth a topaz, the tenth a chrysophorus, the eleventh a jacinth, the twelfth an amethyst. So the top color is like a beautiful purple color. So this is just kind of like a visual imagery um, of what it looked like. On the east side, the north side, south side, and then the west side. One of the predominant colors is the um, uh, well, go well, green, but the the, the, the uh, green jade, the emerald jade, Amaz Amazonite. Oh my gosh, Amazonite, the uh, peridot, and the chrysoprase, uh, and all these other colors. Still, like each side had a variation of green in it. Not every side had a bluish color. Not every side had a pinkish color. Not every side had a gold color. But every side had some form or some degree of green in it. Isn't that interesting? So there's a strong, strong green persuasion that surrounds not only the gates of heaven, but the foundation of heaven. Pausing for dramatic effect. So you can see on the east side, the spinach green, the sapphire blue, the misty white. North side, emerald green, pale gray pink, red. South side, honey gold, sea green, yellowish green. And the west side, apple green, lavender, purple, purple violet. You didn't realize heaven was so colorful, did you? So in the English, according to the to the uh, database table here, um, the first side, the English side, is the, the English word. Uh, the color is in the middle. The Hebrew name is right here. And the Greek name is right here. So if you're ever reading the Bible and you come across the world, say something like, um, and I saw the, the, uh, the Eospis, and the child did uh, uh, Dion, a Kotgan, the Sardini, the Tobazian, or the Chrysophrase. You go, what the heck is that? Just kind of look back at this chart, and you can tell you what colors they were specifically talking about. Whether it be the apple green color, the honey gold color, the emerald green color, or the spinach green color. <laughs> South side of the kingdom. <laughs> I love that. South side of the kingdom is uh, honey gold, sea green, and yellow green. But it's really interesting. Uh, it, it all just kind of, uh, it works. You know, the first, the east side is kind of weird because you got the spinach green, the sapphire blue, and the misty white. Not a fan of that color combination, but I get it. I get it because it takes, uh, what is it, blue and yellow to make green? So somewhere in between there, there's a yellow... Uh, hidden, hidden yellow somewhere. 
And remember we talked about in Deuteronomy uh, 3316, finding out the, uh, I'm sorry, uh, 3319, they shall call the peoples of the, to, the, to the mountain. There they shall offer sacrifices of righteousness, for they shall suck the bounty of the seas and treasures hidden in the sand. So when you look at the lapis luzi, there's obviously something about the blue because green and yellow make, I'm sorry, blue, uh, blue and yellow, yeah, blue and yellow make green. So there's something about having on the east side the spinach green and the sapphire blue and the misty white. I, I like to like to really look into that because why is that? That's significant. And then we have got the, the lavender and the purple violet because red and blue make purple violet uh, and or lavender. So I would like to understand from the west side. Interesting enough, the east side and the west side, um, how they've got a color combinations. We have the north and south are pretty much, pretty much set. They are what they are. They are what they are. So I know most of you guys are probably trying to figure out, like, uh, uh, your birth color <laughs> and your birthstone has a whole lot more to do with the 12 tribes and the 12 apostles. Also with that, on the color spectrum, we talked about it for the past few weeks, uh, the, the, the different vibrations that it, that it gives off. So you may be attracted to a particular color, and I'm not trying to get all horoscopy or, or weird cultures on you. I'm just saying that heaven, heaven specifically, God himself specifically told Moses, I want blue, I want purple, and I want gold. That's what I want. So he actually chose the color pattern, Chose the material and the way to lay it out. So not only has God an interior decorator, he's mimicking what's happening above down on the earth below. So we are to have that beautiful place here on us, on, on earth. So yes, there, may, there could be an attraction or a pull towards a specific color. Like, I love the lapis luzi. I love that because I love my color. Blue is my favorite color. Uh, but to understand and to go, oh, wow. It's also the color of revelation, of transparency. And it's just a beautiful thing that kind of fits into the whole prophetic stream. So I'm like, ah, I get that. I get that. Now, I'm just now I touch on the horoscope. I'm saying that because while growing up, I, I dabbled a little bit in horoscope. Not that I was all into it, but, you know, the thing, the style was, oh, what sign of you? Oh, you're a Taurus? Oh, okay, so you like green? And I thought, like, do I like green? Oh, right, that's cool. That's all right. All right, I guess I'm a Taurus. I'm supposed to like green. So I thought I was supposed to like it because somebody said uh, Taurus is green. So I, I thought that was my color. So I was like, <laughs> but all in reality, I go, gosh, I wish my color was blue. I, I said that. I literally said those words. I wish my color was blue because that's, I'm, I'm, trying, I'm drawn to blue. I'm not drawn to green. I'm drawn to blue. I mean, green's okay. Don't get me wrong, but I'm drawn to blue. So I'm not talking about horoscopes. I'm talking about what you feel. Everyone's got their favorite color. Everyone's got that, that initial color they just can't live without. There's an attraction. There's an, a reason why you're attracted to that color. There's a reason why. There's a spiritual reason why you're attracted to that color. One, it's probably somehow connected to uh, either one of the 12 apostles or the 12 sons of Israel. So, look into, yeah, Jesus Purple, yeah, yeah. Look into that. Look at that. It should, it should be fun. So, I want to kind of like tie in from we're talking about the colors of the rainbow. And then we're talking about the color schemes of all you were able to persuade and manipulate and understand understand why the frequency and vibrations of different colors cause you to act different ways in various ways. But then also understanding how every tribe of Israel had its own color and also every um, apostle of Jesus had their own color. So there's all these, these connections with color. Um, I, I did the spiritual crown, so I don't know if I should do that again, but... Uh, there's a spiritual crown uh, uh, YouTube video that also goes more into depth about different colors because on the crown When a king puts a crown on his head, he's got all these different gemstones on the crown and it's so beautiful because Spiritually saying but if you were to rotate the crown different revelations take place even back this way different things happen in the spirit realm so even the way the rotation of the different colors in a particular room or atmosphere changes the environment, brings solution, and deliverance. Any questions or comments? 
Ah, Judy. Uh, we can't hear you, Judy. Hello. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, that's not good. Here we go. I was just talking. You know when um in the beginning when you put the twelve jewels up, like the chart with all twelve? Can you put yeah, that up yeah. again so I can catch a screenshot of it? Oh, sure. Sure. Okay. And then I have um two other things that I wanted to say. One of them is um when you were going through them, you pronounced Manasha, but is that M A N A S S E H? Yes. Well, not Okay, not that one, the one that literally had the jewels on it. Oh. Like the first, yeah. That's Seven's middle remember. name, and I've always pronounced it Manasa. So I'm saying it wrong. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> oh, this one? Uh -huh, yeah, that one. Thank you. Okay, I got it. And then the, the other thing I wanted to say was um, when my mom passed, you know, well, you guys know it, it was really hard. And um, I read this book and it was about um, a man who had died and gone to heaven and came back. And he, one of the things that he talked about was the colors and how vibrant he was saying, like, you know, the blue is like a blue that you've never seen before. And just saying how beautiful the colors were. And he said, um, and this was the thing that I got from the whole book that really helped me. He said, when people die and go to heaven, like when they're like in the process of dying or whatever you would say, it's right. not that they want to leave you. It's that they get there and what they see is so beautiful and irresistible that they just want to be there. Yes. And so it's not, you know, because we feel like, well, why did they leave? You know, I didn't understand. And especially the way that my mom passed, like it, it made no sense to me. I, I couldn't believe just because of how my mother was so giving and everything. And I don't share this often, but I'm going to go ahead and say it. She, she was having a procedure on her heart and she, she died on the table. And that really hurt me just knowing like who my mom was and how she was and everything. And so then hearing it from that perspective, I could see my mom like, oh, I want to go over there. <laughs> like that, that, that made it better. So I just wanted to say, share that. <laughs> well, thank you for that. Yeah, I, I, I almost like I've told you guys before, but there was a, um, a woman who, um, her mom had, I'm sorry, her aunt had passed, and she actually left God. She left the church because she said she prayed, she fasted, and God did not revive her when there was, you know, the time before she passed. And so when she did pass, she felt God isn't real because God didn't answer my prayer, God didn't deliver me, God didn't help me, and so she had all this animosity towards God because God didn't answer a prayer and she goes I did everything and she did she went to the motion she goes I I blessed my pastor I blessed the poor I fasted I gave I went to every and so she thought by doing all these works was going to somehow you know um get her prayer answered and it was more or less than she said you know the only reason why I came here because my you know my, I was told to but I am still angry and I'm mad at God because he didn't save my auntie and I'm just sitting there going like, well, what happens is this. It, when people, when they pass on, there's in, some, some, in certain cases, they're given the opportunity to come back if they got unfinished business or if they really feel, you know, I can, I can make a difference. If their destiny or their assignments are fulfilled. But the thing is this. All the pain they were feeling on earth is gone. All the aches, all the vomiting, all the diseases, they're all gone. So what happens is when they're in that in that place in in heaven before the Father, and there's no pain, and they're happy, a lot of times they choose to stay where they are. And she goes, "Oh, so it wasn't me." And I'm thinking like, "No, why, why would you think that?" And she goes, "Oh, because then she she realized she goes she wasn't a lot of pain every day. She was in agonizing pain." So this was a good thing. Oh, yeah, it was a good thing. And she goes, oh, okay. And that's all it took. It's all it took for her that, 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 that uh, the realization is they are truly in a more better place where there's no more pain. And it just took that little nudge right there. And so, you know, she's going back to church, so loving God, because she took it personal, like, why didn't God answer my prayer? 
we also have to take that person's perspective. And if they're not feeling good, if they're in pain, why bring them back? To where you go, woohoo, bring them back, Auntie. And she's like, ah, bring me back. Yeah, celebrations. Yeah, I'll go ahead and have a party. No, no, I'll be here. I'll be fine. Ah, go, 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 celebrate. Ah, God, just kill me. You know, then they, you know, they get in a place where they just want to die. But no, no, you know, selfish you, you gotta have, you know, bring her back. So, if they're ready to go, it's time to go. Um, unless, they, you know, we can pray God heal them while they're here. But if that's the case, if that's not the case, then we just gotta understand that uh, they're gonna finally be in a place where there's no more pain, where there's peace, and there's joy, and there's love. It's a beautiful thing, y'all. My sister, like I told you guys before, when she died, we didn't know the cause of death. We, I had just assumed it was by somebody drugging her or her taking some kind of concoction that somebody gave her. Like the, the phone call was, the, the initial call was, hey, uh, 9 yeah, there's some girl, she's dead. She ain't moving. That was 911 call. It was at a bar. She, she worked, she was a bartender. And then it was like, she, she's, she's not moving. And so they thought somebody slipped her something, gave her something. So at her funeral, I'm at her funeral, I'm mad dogging everybody. And I tell Pamela, I go, the person who comes up to us and says, I'm so sorry, they're the ones who did it because they've got a guilty conscience. I mean, that, that was my mindset. That's where I was at that time. And, you know, people were, you know, there was, there was a genuine, 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 you know, sorrow and grief and all that was going on. And I went home still kind of angry. So kind of upset, but then we got the toxicology report and come to find out, apparently my sister had a heart condition that she didn't tell anybody about. She was taking medication that her, her, boy, her uh, father of the baby, he knew, but didn't share that with us. So in fact, that's the very same thing that took my father, my stepfather, this, this is his son, uh, his daughter. Um, you know, but we, you know, I've, I've known the guy as for all my all my life, majority of my life. So I called him my dad because he was there when I was five years old up until the time he passed. So I've always known him to be my father. When he had Jamie, she was actually my um, stepsister. But because, you know, we were there, she, she's just my sister. Except that as that. So what took his life also took her. So it was, a, it was a, a genetic thing. So I was like, oh, oh, okay. No foul play? All right, I can live with that. Okay, and I was okay. I was okay knowing it was no foul play. It was not, nothing malicious or, uh, you know, some violent act or, or you know, murder or nothing like that. It was just basically a bad heart, and I was okay. I thought it was just weird how hmm, that thing like that can snap you and just change your whole mindset because now the truth, the truth that we know, that sets us free. Now we can all, you know, again pray for our our loved ones and, and our family and friends. And, you know, I'm, I'm constantly getting, you know, hey, pray for my cousin, pray for them. And I do. I, I literally will pray and speak out and say a prayer for that those people. Because I'm, I'm believing God. You know, they're going to get up and walk one day. I promise you. I promise you. That's where, that's where my faith is at. They're going to testify about how good God is when they get up and walk out. Uh, out of the hospital or from their, their, their sick bed. They will. I've seen it happen a few times. I want to see it happen more. John Wimber, he prayed for years. For dead people. He literally would go to the morgue and pray for dead people. That's where he was. That's where his faith was at. And when it actually happened for him, it happened to be when he was on a train. And somebody said, hey, uh, John Woodbury, can you go pray for my, my um, relative because they're not feeling good. So he went to go lay hands on this person, not realizing it was a dead person. He walked into the wrong. They were taking, what do you call it, cadavers. And he prayed for a person. Um... Who was like a, who was dead, and um, that person was walking with his walking with his toe, toe, uh, the toe tag on his feet on his toe identification identification toe tag was on his feet walking around. So people are running from the back of the train because they're seeing this dude who was dead, naked dude with a towel around him, or a little big old gurney thingy, and that set him off. That set him off. So he starts. Bring me your dead. Bring me your dead. And, you know, be asleep. And he, he um, I don't know how many people he's confirmed. I know Heidi Baker 
has about 75 people confirmed. People who are literally holding their own death certificates in their hands in Africa. 75 confirmed. Uh, Brother Mel, Prophet Mel, over 100 confirmed people holding their death certificates in their hand. It's a beautiful thing because it is happening. I wish it would happen more for us. So that's what my faith is at. I see it happen. I know it's happening. I'm believing God is going to continue to happen and in greater fashion and form. And then you'll see the world change, y'all. Then we will see it. Any more questions or comments? My God, what's the prophet's name with over a hundred people? <laughs> oh, Mel. Let me see if I can get that. Mel. Mel Tari. Uh, Mel. Mel Tari. Mel Tari. T A T. Mel. M E L. Tari. T A R I. Such a humble, humble guy too. Sweet guy. Sweet humble guy. I don't know where I don't know I don't know if he's um uh still oh I'm oh, sorry still overseas or not but he comes to, he comes to the states quite often Thank you for sharing you know I'm all over this type of stuff <laughs> Oh yeah 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 uh itinerary uh I I let's see. I'm 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 on his web I'm I'm on his website right now. I'm just trying to see if I can figure out his. Okay, his website is just kind of like blah. Okay. One way. Um. Uh, Notari and Heidi Baker, two people who I know, have uh, personally raised the dead. Just gonna grow. Someone's gonna get used to it. I'm blurring. Okay, that's better. Are you any other questions or comments? Yeah. But yeah, guys. Uh, oh, man. Um, sorry, I lost my train of thought. I was going to go do something else. Ah, what was I going to do? Oh, Wednesday. No, okay. Uh, I want to shut my mouth. I always give out too much. I want to shut my mouth. Wednesday, get ready. <laughs> uh, no previews. Just get, get ready, y'all. It's going to get crazy. So that being said, as we understand what God is doing, and what God is doing in you, if you understand the pull, um, and you can, go, you can kind of go back, and I'll probably put this in the in the, um, the the Facebook chat group, the colors and the, the coordinating uh, attributes with them. Um, not to you know make this an idol or anything, but it's kind of good to understand the reference uh, from Dan and Gad and Naphtali to, to Judah. It would make sense why you would begin to see these different colors at weird times and at weird situations because they happen to be in the atmosphere. All to say that we are called to find the hidden treasures in the sand. The hidden treasures in the sand will bring out the gemstones of heaven. That being said, who's going to be the first millionaire? All of us. <laughs> All of us. Amen. All of us. Because we are the tabernacle of David. But we are so blessed we get we get to become blessings to others. And it's happening. It's happening. So I love you guys. Thank you for letting me have your Saturday afternoon. And I will see you on Wednesday for another mind blowing, uh, sacred cow sacrificing, barbecuing, uh, 
destroyer of religion and tradition <laughs> meeting. We love you guys. Shalom. You too. Shalom. <laughs> Thank you. You're welcome. Shalom. Love you more. Shalom. And happy Father's Day. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Happy yeah. Father's Day to you guys, too. All fathers. Happy Father's Day. Yeah, yeah happy, happy Father's, Father's Day, Day anyway, to all you dads. Thank you. thank you. And all you mothers pull, pulling double duty, happy Mother's Day on Father's Day. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> I'm definitely one of them. <laughs>